All right. Well, I am very blessed to be able to share the word with you today. And I know some of you were on the uh, Zoom call earlier today where John Shanehight was sharing about um, Reformation. And one of, one of the big points of that sharing that actually is an inspiration for me is from what I want to share is there were things in the Reformation that we're looking at things that have been taught and people realizing, okay, we need to rethink this. We need to look at this based on what the word says. And so what I wanted to teach on today was the concept of Hebrews 11.1 1 about the idea of faith being translated as trust. And you know, this again for me was something that I, for years, I had always thought of that faith was what we had. And, and I'm not saying we don't have faith, but then when I read 11, Hebrews 11, 1, and in the Rev, it's translated as trust. I remember initially kind of just taking a step back and say, oh, wait a minute, I thought that was faith. And so as I've looked and in recent times, I've looked into this deeper, and I think the things that um, have been developed in the Rev Bible have really helped me to further understand what God was really expressing when he had Hebrews written. But one I wanted to actually start out with is in Proverbs chapter 3, because this is a verse I'm sure that if we have the little deck of retemory cards, maybe this is one of the the cards that's in that deck, and plus I'll show you that I have this uh, big coffee mug that says trust. <laughs> so as you drink coffee every morning, you can be reminded to trust. But in Proverbs chapter three and in verse five, it says, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean upon your own understanding. Be mindful of him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It will be healing for your navel and a refreshing drink to your bones. <laughs> and you read that and think, wait a minute, my bones don't drink. <laughs> what, are, what are we talking about there? <laughs> but this, this is some great imagery. And again, the, in the Rev, what I like about the Rev is, is some of the commentaries are really just very revealing. And so I wanna just briefly read the commentary on uh, Proverbs 3, 5. It says, do not lean, lean upon your own understanding. The allusion here is to the walking staff that almost every man carried for support and protection, which is why Jesus allowed his apostles to take one when they traveled. Compare Mark 6, 8 in the commentary on Matthew 10, 10. Men leaped, leaned upon their staffs in all kinds of situations, but they were notoriously unreliable for a number of reasons. If modern hiking is any guide to us, the most common reason a staff is unreliable is that it can un unexpectedly slip, causing a dangerous fall. Also, a staff may break and pierce the hand of the one leaning on it. This happened often enough that the emissary of the king of Assyria spoke about it to the people in Jerusalem, and that's referenced in 2 Kings and Isaiah. So the point is, what are we leaning on and how dependable is that? And the point that it's making here is our own understanding is not dependable. But what is dependable is our trust in Yahweh. And so also just as a kind of a side note, if you go to Proverbs chapter 17, And in verse 22, it says, a cheerful heart is a good cure, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. So if our bones are dried up, they're not drinking. <laughs> the point is, you know, the, the imagery here is that a, a cheerful heart is not just about telling jokes with your friends. It's about the joy that we have and the joy that we see when we trust God and see the great things that he does as, as a result of our trust. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one, which is obviously 
my big starting point. And the reason I was thinking about this again, and I, and I think especially based on what John was sharing this morning about the Reformation is that when I started really going through this, it, it gives you a better understanding of what trust is all about. And um, so why is the Rev version, does it translate the Greek word pistis, which I think we've, maybe most of us have understood for many years was always faith or believing. And why is that trust? Why is that significant? Well, this Greek word pistis actually shows up 228 times in the New Testament. And in the ancient Greek, the word means confidence, trust, or assurance. Our current definition of trust is assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. So where did we get the word faith then in so many of the Bible versions? Well, when the Greek New Testament was translated into Latin, fides, F-I-D-E-S, fides, was the natural choice as a translation of pistis because fides meant trust, confidence, reliance, belief. Our current definition of faith has unfortunately kind of morphed into belief in something for which there is no proof. In other words, ah, just take it by faith. You know, maybe some of us have heard that. Well, what are we taking if we don't really understand what it is that we're taking. And what I love about the, how the Rev translates the second half of this verse one in Hebrews 11, it says it's a conviction regarding things not seen. And the Greek word for, for conviction is elenkos, and it means proof or conviction. And what I really want to focus on today is the fact that we can trust because God has given proof. It's not just some idea that we think is a good idea, but that God has given us proof, and we'll see that. So let's look at some examples here in Hebrews 11. We're going to go down to chapter, or to verse 7, Hebrews 11, 7, and... I think we're all very familiar with Noah, and I think this is a great verse here. It says, by trust, Noah being divinely warned about things not yet seen, out of reverent regard, prepared an ark for the salvation of his house. By this trust, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes because of trust. And we'll see this more about how trust and righteousness are things that are tied together. And so we know that Noah obviously went through some difficult, challenging times because number one, building that ark, I'm sure was not a three week task. <laughs> As we all know, that took a bit of time. Um, and then also he had all the people like the, what I liked about that video of the, from casting crowns there as it talks about things laughing at us because of what we are, we are doing. And yet, because we do what we do by God's trust, we get the victory and the people laughing end up being the ones that are falling down. And obviously that was the case with Noah, you know, and, and it says he was being divinely warned about things not yet seen. And that divinely warned, again, in the Rev commentary, briefly, it, it uses the example of Moses getting ready to build the tabernacle, and God gave him all the plans for how to do that. And so he followed those plans and ended up with the tabernacle, as uh, Noah did in ending up with the ark. So the trust that, that Noah had resulted in obviously a great proof and result. And then in, in verse uh, eight, as we move down the line here a little bit, I'm gonna just touch on a couple of these because this whole chapter would spend, you know, four hours looking at all of these, but um, it says by trust, verse eight, by trust Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place that he was about to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. 
you know, and I think about that and think, boy, you know, what I have I ever been doing something where I know God was inspiring me to do it, but I wasn't really sure where I was going. And yet, look at what at what Abraham had, then he he got to the promised land. Verse nine, by trust he went to live in the promised land as, a, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were couriers of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has the lasting foundation, whose builder and maker is God. You know, and so Abraham had a lot to look to, forward to, but because of his trust, then he got the proof. He got to the promised land. And then also, again, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this, verse 11, by trust, even Sarah herself received power to conceive seed when she was past age, since she counted him faithful who had promised. And so she got the proof, the result of her trust. And obviously, then that's how uh, Isaac was born. So we see these great examples. And, and one other thing that I want to look at that David's not listed here, but in if we go to Psalm 56, because I think this is a, a great example also of David in Psalm 56. And we're just going to read this whole Psalm. It's, a, it's a 13 verses here, but at verse one, Psalm 56, it says, be merciful to me, O God, for man wants to swallow me. All day long, he attacks and oppresses me. And what this is, is this is when David, um, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. And uh, so this is the psalm that he wrote. And it says, my enemies want to swallow me up all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. And again, I think back to some of the things that John was sharing this morning about the the men that went through the Reformation and just the terrible things, they were burned at the stake and killed, I mean, just for standing on truth. But then David says in verse three, why am I afraid? I will put my trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I will put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long, they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They continue, or excuse me, they conspire to lurk, watching my steps. They are eager to take my life. Will they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O oh God. You number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Aren't they in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day that I call. I know this. God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In Yahweh, I will praise his word. I have put my trust in God. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are on me, O God. I will give thanks offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death and prevented my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. So David trusted and he received the proof. And that's the key here that I see in so many of these records is that trust is not just thinking, oh, that would be great if that happened. It's much, it's much more than that. It's knowing that God has promised and he will carry his promises through. And we have proof of that. I'm sure in our own lives, we've seen times when God has done something where he's given us the proof that he carried that out. And I'm thinking maybe when I'm done sharing here, if any of you have some, some thoughts or some uh, incidents like that you want to share, please consider. So these were great examples of people who trusted God. And also, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 11, because I think the conclusion of Hebrews chapter 11 has an important truth as well. So we're going to back to Hebrews 11 and verse 32. Um, it says, and what should I, what more shall I say? For the time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through trust 
conquered kingdoms, enforced righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the mouth of the sword. From weakness, they were made strong, became strong in war, put to fight, flight foreign enemies. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting their release in order to obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. Boy, again, this morning we heard about so many people in the Reformation through all these years that went through all these terrible things. It says, uh, they were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were murdered with the sword, they went around with sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Verse 39, all these, and all these, though having obtained a good testimony because of their trust, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect apart from us. And so I think sometimes in the past, I've read those last two verses and kind of scratched my head and said, well, wait a minute, these people did all these things, but they didn't receive the promise. Well, the promise referred to here is eternal life. And, you know, when they fell asleep, they hadn't received eternal life, but they will receive it at the resurrection of the just and will receive that eternal life at the rapture when God raises us from the dead. If we've fallen asleep or if we're still alive, we'll be changed, as we know and talks about in Corinthians. It says, you know, God having provided something better for us, this is talking about us having that eternal life as well. And so when I considered that again, and, and that was one of the things in the, in the Rev commentary that really helped me see the light of this, is that, you know, we have that trust and we have that proof that we will be born. And we will be, you know, we have that hope that we will have that eternal life. <clears throat> so the other thing that kind of came to my mind as I was going through this, though, is some of the teachings that we've had in the past, and I don't say this to <clears throat> cause any harm or anything, but, um, it, you know, I think about what some of the things we were taught about, you know, faith or believing is a force, and that what you believe is what you receive, and because, because you believe it, it happens, <clears throat> or if you have fear, then you know, the, your fear causes something terrible to happen. Well, then as, as time went on and, and we moved down into some of the other teachings that, that John Shea Knight and John Lynn have done about faith is not a force. <clears throat> and it's a, in, in the Rev commentary, and there's a whole appendix in verse, appendix 16, and, and I'll just read a quick segment here. It says, Regular trust occurs when there is a trustworthy object to trust. In contrast, the manifestation of faith occurs when God or the Lord Jesus Christ gives a specific revelation to a Christian. That revelation is God's green light and gives the Christian the authority to do what he cannot do by his own human power. If God gives us a Christian, if God gives a Christian the revelation, to heal a person, then the Christian can operate the manifestation of faith or trust and healing and bring and it brings about healing. You know, and so in 1 Corinthians 12, we, we hear about the manifestation of faith as one of the nine manifestations. But again, it's not this magic power that comes out of us, is that when we provide that trust, then God is able to provide that power through us and that healing can occur but we aren't the one doing the healing. It's God's power through us that accomplishes that healing. And so I think that's an important distinction to make as we consider the, the concept of trust versus faith. And I'm not saying that, you know, if we say we have faith, that that's a bad thing. But what I'm saying is that, that trust is really more about the practical application in that we have that great proof. 
you know, and so, you know, again, that phrase, well, just take it by faith, you know, it doesn't matter. What are we taking? <laughs> We're just assuming something's going to happen and we have no proof of it. Where's the confidence in that? There is none, but trust we have that confidence because we know God has promised and he will bring it to pass. And that's why, to my mind, the word trust is just so much a better explanation of what the word pistis is all about. So one of the other things I want to touch on here is that righteousness is by trust, not by works of the law. And we learned that, I, th I think it was, I don't remember if it was last Thursday or last Tuesday, when we, I think it might've been last Thursday when we heard about um, Galatians. So, but I wanna start by going to Romans chapter three and just look at this. Romans three and verse 21. It says, or excuse me, I got to the wrong one here, excuse me, I jumped ahead. <laughs> Clicking on the wrong button here, here we go. There we go, Romans 3.21, but now a righteousness from God has revealed, has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testified to it, namely the righteousness from God that comes through trust in Jesus Christ to all those who believe, for there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. You know, and this was such a great revelation in the early church and that our righteousness came through our trust in Jesus Christ. And also, you know, if we go to uh, Romans 5 in verse 1, we see this again. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by trust, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by trust into his grace in which we stand. And so let us boast in the hope of the glory of God. And I just think that's these are such inspirational verses, even for us that have been around for so long here and you know we accepted i don't know about all of you i accepted jesus christ as my lord and savior in 1974 my senior year in college never looked back but uh, let's go to galatians and in chapter two and we'll see this again galatians 2 and verse 16 says knowing that a person is not declared righteous by the works of the law but by trust in, but through trust in Jesus Christ, even when we believed in Christ Jesus, so that we are declared righteous by trust in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be declared righteous. That's not to say that we shouldn't be doing works, because we have, you know, great verses about, you know, quote unquote, faith without works is dead. Yeah, well, we do works because we've been declared righteous. And so we can do those things. And it's not that our works that make us righteous, but it's our trust. And we see that in so many cases. And, and now let's go to Galatians chapter five. And in verse five, Galatians five, five, again, it says, for by the spirit and based on trust, we eagerly wait for the righteousness for which we hope for in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value, but what matters is trust working through love. And I just think that's such a great, a great encouragement for us that we have that trust working through love and that as we trust, we have those promises. And as we trust those promises and we walk out, and then we have that proof like we saw with Noah and Abraham and Sarah and David. So there are just so many great examples. And again, I'm sure we all have examples in our own lives. And so again, in this dark time, I'll, I'll hold up this little bracelet that I had done years ago in a teaching I had on the hope. And I love the saying about, I refuse to sink. 
you know, we have a hope. And I know uh, Shirley Kalinowski apparently has a necklace that has that on there. When I held that up one time at a fellowship, she just busted out laughing and was so thankful to see somebody else that had the same saying. <laughs> so because of that hope that we read in Hebrews 6, 19, we can refuse to sink. And so I wanted to share something that was, I thought was really interesting in light of all the situations that are going on in this day and time. And my wife, Donna, um, gets on this uh, website called Intercessors for America and about people that pray for our country and situations. And there was this really wonderful sharing that a woman did that I'd like to read for you. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's pretty lengthy. You put the, uh, the link in the chat also for this if you want to see the whole thing. But uh, it's, it's called Elijah's Ravens Bring Us Hope in a time of fear. And so to, to get there, let's go to, uh, we're gonna read about Elijah. And so that's in 1 Kings chapter 17. And she started out in this article talking about, some of you may be familiar with uh, Edgar Allan Poe's poem about the raven. <laughs> and. She always thought, well, you know, ravens are, especially here we are on October 31st, Halloween and ravens, and, you know, all this evil stuff that happens with ravens. And it's interesting because Don and I lived in Maryland for quite a number of years and the Baltimore football team is the ravens because Edgar Allan Poe apparently was from Baltimore. But anyway, uh, I'll just read a few segments here. She says, since the pandemic began, the Lord has been encouraging me, encouraging me to kick fear to the curb so I can trust him completely. This has not always been easy, but I've tried to be obedient. But lately, as vaccine mandates become a daily reality, I found myself worrying about all my friends and family who were affected by them. Every day, someone I knew was being threatened by these mandates, including my own husband, I began losing sleep in the middle of the night. I would ask the Lord, what will happen to my friends and family if they lose their jobs? How will they provide for their families? And the Lord gave me one word, ravens. <laughs> At first I thought, well, that's, that was a strange answer to my question. But then I remembered that there was an amazing story in 1 Kings 17 where God used ravens to provide food for the prophet Elijah. And so we'll just read this, 1 Kings 17. It says, Elijah, verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there will not be dew or rain these years except by my word. And the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, go from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself in the Wadi Cherith that is east of the Jordan and you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to sustain you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived in the Wadi Cherith, that is east of Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the, excuse me, in the evening, and he drank from the brook. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And going back to this article, it says, after I read the story, many light bulbs went off in my brain. First, firstly, I realized that God chose the most unlikely bird to provide for Elijah. Ravens were considered unclean because they were scavengers, which eat the flesh of dead rotting animals. Elijah, who was an observant Jew, would never think of coming in close contact with this kind of bird, much less receive food from one. Ravens are not kosher, but God knew what he was doing. In a way, God was saying, Elijah, I know you would never associate with these dirty birds, but I need you to completely trust me. Do not worry, just let them feed you. And I thought, boy, and then she goes on 
to say, uh, I'll just keep reading here, sorry, it says, at this point, many of us are confronted with what seems like a no-win situation. When it comes to vaccine mandates, we fear the loss of our jobs and livelihoods. Stories like Elijah and the Ravens remind us that sometimes we may be cut off from our jobs or even our friends and family. Yet, to our surprise, we may be taken to the desert where we are given a brook of water and an unlikely source of provision. God is certainly creative, and I truly believe that no matter what happens, he will sustain us, whether it be through providing another source of income or perhaps by using an unusual opportunity that will place us on a new path. The ravine became the hiding place for Elijah when he confronted, or he, he would, excuse me, we can be comforted knowing God will provide a refuge for us as well. And I just thought that this was so inspiring, but then the end of this article was just a mind blower. <clears throat> and I got to read this to you. And if you want to see this whole article, there's even some pictures that she has in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, it says, now <clears throat> here comes the amazing part of this article. Recently, I was vacationing in Wyoming visiting Grand Teton National Park, as well as Yellowstone. While I was there, I noticed many ravens flying through the mountains and valleys. Watching them, I felt a quickening in my spirit as I thought of Elijah and the ravens. Before going on vacation, I had felt much anxiety about the mandates I was reading about in the news. But when I saw these large, beautiful birds, I felt the Lord reminding me that he is the great provider. As I watched the ravens glide seamlessly through the air, I said a small prayer that went like this. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I would love to get a close-up picture of a raven to remind me that no matter what happens, you will provide. Then I said, and I will also share the picture with everyone I know so I can encourage them. Little did I know Jesus would answer that request quicker than I can even say the word raven. After a prayer, I walked back to the car and there before my eyes was the most stunning sight, a raven perched next to my vehicle. I could not believe it. My husband began taking pictures as the raven stayed in one spot and posed for over 20 minutes. <laughs> I think the raven would have let me pick him up if I had tried. He cawed happily and stretched his wings like it was one big party. I couldn't help but feel overjoyed and even jumping up and down, several people walked over to marvel at this majestic raven who seemed to love having his picture taken. In that moment, I realized Jesus answered what I had considered a small prayer, yet he answered in a big way. I knew he was showing me that if he can provide a raven to take pictures of, he can also provide whatever else I needed. As I looked to the left of where the raven was perched, I could see the Jackson Lake Dam, which holds thousands of gallons of water. Seeing this reminded me of the living water Jesus can sustain my family and friends with resources beyond anything I could ever hope or imagine. And I just thought, boy, what a great, great article. And uh, so I'll, I will, uh, Put that in the chat. Now, there you go. You see it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so here's the woman in, in, in the uh, story there, and there's the raven perched up next to her car there. <laughs> so, you know, when we when we saw this, it just what a great story. So I'll put the link to this whole thing in the chat. It's a little longer than that, but uh, so those are the things that I wanted to share. And I know there's one more song that uh, I wanted to have played here that kind of wraps up because my main point again was that we have the proof that God's trust, you know, that, that uh, God has promised and given us proof. And I just thought it was great that the woman got the proof of the raven sitting next to her car. <laughs> so if you wanna go ahead and play that song, Michelle. <clears throat> 